All right, how's everybody doing? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. It is Tuesday, December 24th, 2019, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. So everybody, share this uh, broadcast on your Facebook page and on YouTube. Invite your friends to tune in as well. So I wanted to uh, let people know briefly about the uh, sale we have going on, the promotion we have going on right now for advertising your African-American-owned business with the African History Network. Uh, so African-American-owned businesses, uh, African-American uh, uh, business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Uh, and then also I'm going to talk a little bit about cooperative economics and a little bit about Kwanzaa, all right, because I'm speaking at two Kwanzaa events coming up. Uh, in a few days here, and we know Kwanzaa is December 26th through January the 1st, and one of the principles, the fourth principle of Kwanzaa, um, Ujima, is cooperative economics, okay? So, uh, our current promotion, buy one month, uh, get two months free. Buy one month, get two months free. So, if you are a uh, African-American business owner, you may have an e-commerce store, you may have a brick-and-mortar store, uh, you may sell clothing, whether it's... Uh, Western clothing, whether it's um, uh, African garb, etc., shoes, uh, health and beauty products, which are really uh, big. Um, you definitely want to advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customer service at African History Network.com, customer service at African History Network.com, and we will let you know how you can advertise with us. Also, uh, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. So, um, what we do is we take your 30 second and 60 second commercial and put it into the um, uh, audio podcast of our Sunday night show, the African History Network show. And also we do that in, uh, we also put your uh, 30 second, 60 second commercial in the, um, we put that also into the Facebook live broadcast I do throughout the week as well. So we reach thousands of people across the country uh, on a weekly basis. How's everybody doing today? Okay, uh, we got John and uh, everybody. Uh, how's everybody doing? Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Okay, so you may be a book author. You may write children's books. You may write uh, books dealing with history or self empowerment, motivational speaking, etc. Uh, we know education is big. Uh, more and more African American parents are uh, looking at homeschooling their children, or they're looking at um, books and curriculums to augment what their children are not getting in a traditional school. Uh, you may have an upcoming conference coming up in January, or February, March of 2020 that you want to advertise. Uh, it could be something done with African American History Month, it could be a women's conference, what have you. Uh, you may have a catering service or a restaurant. Okay, but you definitely want to advertise with the African History Network. You may sell African jewelry, and then we know fitness products and uh, different types of fitness services. That's really big uh, as well. Okay, so uh, email us at customer service at African History Network dot com. Customer service at African History Network dot com, and then also uh, during my Facebook Live broadcast, we promote uh, your business during my Facebook Live broadcast uh, throughout that I do throughout the week on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. And I take those broadcasts, turn them into audio podcasts also. And uh, we also post those videos on our YouTube cha channel so you get exposure on different platforms. So our audio podcasts are on eight different podcast platforms. We're on um, iTunes, uh, Blog Talk Radio, CastBox, uh, Acast, Stitcher, FM Player, TuneIn, um, we're on eight pot. We're on eight platforms that I know of. Okay, and I found out about uh, Castbox by accident because uh, somebody tweeted me uh, that they just listened to a great podcast that I did, and I said, "Where'd you listen to it?" They said, "Castbox." I said, "What the hell is Castbox?" This is like a year ago, something like that. So they sent me. So they sent me the link, you know. And um, Castbox is an app. I downloaded it, and they have all these different. Uh, podcast from all these different podcasters, okay? And I didn't know my podcast uh, automatically got uploaded there when I upload podcasts. So, well, eight different podcast platforms, okay? Um, 
how you doing uh, Zandria, Carl, Sherwin, just a few of the people watching. All right, so when we look at uh, African American owned businesses and we look at you know Kwanzaa and cooperative economics, Ujima, um, we have a long rich history in cooperative economics, but a lot of people don't know this. And I encourage people to read the book Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard. Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard. A History of African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. And I interviewed her back in, I think it was 2014, 2000, I think it was maybe about 2014, something like that. I interviewed her. She was coming to Detroit uh, to speak in Detroit. And her book deals with the history of African American involvement in uh, cooperative economics. So I, I saw some um, interviews that she did. Well, not in, well, I saw one interview that she did. Uh, it's on YouTube, but I, I read some articles um, which she's interviewed. And News1.com has a really good article um, entitled Stop Saying Black People Don't Support Each Other Economically. Stop Saying Black People Don't Support Each Other Economically. And they interviewed her and talked about her book. And one of the things she said was that um, in most places I've spoken, people think that we did not engage in cooperative economics. Uh, and she is a um, political economist and professor of community justice and social economic development at John Jay College in New York City. And with all the talk now about the Constitution and the Federalist Papers, things like this, we know that John Jay was one of the signers of the U.S. Constitution. And John Jay wrote some of the Federalist Papers, okay, that we hear a lot uh, being talked about. Uh, right now, and I talked about that on my Sunday night show, uh, the Federalist Papers and impeachment and uh, understanding the U.S. Constitution. So she said, my challenge was to prove that we did. My challenge was to prove that we did have a history of cooperative economics here in the U.S. Now, these principles of cooperative economics we brought with us from Africa. Okay. And she says that she assumed that she would spend a few years researching whatever cooperative she could dig up. She said instead she was met with a history that spanned uh, black, America, uh, black Americans period of enslavement to the present day and support for cooperatives from almost every major black political leader along the way. Okay, where we talk about Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, uh, we're talking about Dr. King, where we talk about Dr. W.B. Du Bois, etc. One of the examples that she gave, and she talks about in this, in, in so, talks about in this book here, and I've read articles dealing with this. Uh, this is probably the probably the largest um, cooperative, uh, largest cooperative that we had. This was the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union. The Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union, and this one existed from 1886 to 1891. Okay, and they're going to grow to about 1.2 million uh, members. And a lot of people don't know about this. So, you know, when I was taking, uh, when I was in business school at Wayne State University here in Detroit, um, largely in most of the business classes I took, we did not study cooperatives. We did not study co-ops in general. Okay, and this is back in the 90s, right? Uh, but we have a deep, rich history of this. So the... Uh, Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union existed from 1886 to 1891 and it was formed to aid African American farmers particularly with mortgage payments and marketing to help them pay their mortgage okay because a lot of a lot of times people talk about the fact that we owned um, millions of acres of land and we we're going to acquire millions of acres of land after slavery ends okay so um, Chattel slavery ends in 1865. We know by um, 1910 we own we own almost about 16 million acres of land. Okay, but what a lot of people don't talk about is that a lot of that land we have mortgages on. We didn't own the land outright. The bank owned the land, and we're paying we're paying a mortgage. Okay, and if you miss a certain number of uh, mortgage payments, uh, you lose the land. Okay, so we're going to have cooperatives that help us raise money so we can make the 
uh, mortgage payments, all right? And then uh, somebody asked, what's the email address again? Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And we can get you all uh, started today. Uh, and we'll get you, we'll get your ads in the Sunday night uh, podcast also, the podcast um, from this past Sunday. Um, and what you can do, if you don't have an ad, you can write a script. Uh, and I can record a 30-second, uh, 60-second second audio commercial for you or you can just send me some bullet points and I'll put something together for you as well okay and if you want to adjust it two weeks three weeks from now that's fine also if you say look I want to take advantage of this because uh, we have this promotion going on for a couple more days buy one month get two months free we have special pricing for you that we normally don't have if uh, you say well look I'm not uh, I won't be ready to advertise to middle of January or something like that uh, contact us we can get your ads locked in today you can start running your ads when you're ready to, okay? All right, because we got space for a few more advertisers. All right, so, um, but what happens is, is with the, um, we, we talk about the land that we own, but we don't talk about the fact that a lot of that land, there was a mortgage on it, okay? The, and, and this is one of the ways that we lost land. Either we couldn't make the mortgage payment or, we lost we lost land because of um, uh, taxes, back taxes. So oftentimes, the value of our land was overassessed, so that the amount of taxes we had to pay on the land was increased. And then, if we couldn't pay taxes on the land, then we lose the land as well. These are there were there were various methods that were used to steal the land from us. Okay, it wasn't just us being ran off the land by the KKK or something like that. There were other there were other methods as well. Okay, so um, so the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union provided other community services. Uh, also, it promoted alliances between farmers and laborers, and served as a resource for sharing agricultural techniques and coordinating efforts for planting and harvesting. So they're teaching African American farmers better techniques so they can get a better harvest, they can make more money, they can become more efficient. Okay, this is a co-op. And oftentimes when we hear about co-ops or we think about co-ops, right, we think that's something that uh, maybe white millennials do or maybe something that only white people do with co-ops. No, those concepts of cooperative economics are concepts that we were practicing in Africa. And we're bringing those concepts here to the U.S. So the Color Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union also worked to counter exploitation by white landowners and violence from vigilantes who were trying to run us off our land, take our land, etc. With more than one million members and branches, uh, cooperative stores in the uh, ports of Norfolk, Charleston, Mobile, New Orleans, and Houston, it was the largest black organization of its day. Okay, so it, Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard was asked, um, why is this history relatively lost? Why don't most, most African Americans know about the history of the co-ops, the Free African Society of 1787? Uh, the Colored Merchants Association in 1920, about 1928, 1929, and the Colored Merchants Association came out of the uh, Negro Business League, uh, founded in 1900 by Booker T. Washington. Okay, and Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard said, "I'm not sure, but there there's a lack of education about co-ops in general in our society. Uh, I, in general, I agree with that." She said, "We teach about capitalism." And present capitalism as the only op as the only option. Also, often whenever African Americans attempted to establish them, the co-ops, their efforts were sabotaged by white competitors and white supremacists. In many cases, it was through violence, but in but in others, it could it could be as simple as having your rent raised banks denying your loan, or even being priced out of insurance, okay? Now, and when we look at the White Citizens Council, the White Citizens Council was founded in 1954 in Mississippi, 
as a result, uh, as a backlash to the Brown versus Board of Education U.S. Supreme Court desegregation case. And when we look at the White Citizens Council, that was made up of uh, white bankers and landowners, plantation owners, um, uh, businessmen, things like this, right? So if you uh, were, and, and what's going to happen is the White Citizens Council is going to spread all throughout the South. And uh, it, we see in Mississippi, the White Citizens Council is going to throw their support behind Ross, Ross Barnett. And Ross Barnett becomes the governor of Mississippi. Okay, so they had a lot of clout. So if you uh, uh, were an African-American farmer and you tried to register to vote, the, the member of the White Citizens Council who owns the bank that, you, uh, that your loan is with, they may call your loan in. They may call your loan due because you tried to register to vote. Not because you voted, but because you tried to register to vote. When we look at um, Fannie Lou Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer grew up in Mississippi. She was the youngest of 20 children. Her whole family worked on a plantation. Okay? And Fannie Lou Hamer registered to vote. She was fired from the plantation that she and her family worked on because she registered to vote. So these are different tactics that were being used. Okay, so a lot of times, you know, we, we ask the question, well, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Why didn't they do this? Why did they do that? But a lot of times we don't understand the obstacles that, uh, that they were dealing with. We don't, we, we, we don't understand the, the depth and the obstacles and the complexities of what they were dealing with. Um, she talks about the Colored Farmers uh, Union here, and I'm going to see Colored Farmers Alliance. Let me see. I thought I had it bookmarked. Okay, that's the Colored Merchants Association. Because with the Colored Farmers Alliance, they disbanded. Yeah, right here. Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union, page 55. Okay. Um, they had to disband because of attacks on them by white supremacists, and I think she talks about that here. Um, the Color Farmers National uh, Association uh, um, communicated through branch newspapers to provide information about discriminatory legislation, monopolies, and their effects on African Americans, and the latest initiatives of the organization, such as cooperative exchange projects, lobbying efforts, credit programs, and cost-saving measures. The organization sustained almost continuous opposition to its very existence from the white plantation block and even from Southern, from Southern Alliance uh, members. Okay, and they they only lasted uh, five years, and they basically were uh, pretty much forced to disband. I think it was another article they talk about this, um, but she she goes on to say that um, finally, after years of studying black cooperatives and their place in black life, uh, Jessica Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard says she's taken away just how important economic independence through cooperation has been for black Americans. She said, quote, the black cooperative movement has always been parallel to the black liberation and civil rights movements. The black cooperative movement has always been parallel to the black liberation and civil rights movements. We've mostly heard about the political side of the movement, but you can't name a major black political leader that did not point to cooperatives as a pathway to freedom, okay, end quote. And, and, and this is really important, you know, we, we talk about Dr. King, but we don't talk about the economic side of Dr. King, okay, to talk about Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, but we don't talk about the economic side of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and then there was another article from uh, Vice.com, and Vice.com had 
because I have a number of articles dealing with this. I, I taught entrepreneurship for seven years, and I do presentations dealing with economic empowerment and history, uh, and you know, combine that with African American history. How black co-ops can fight institutional racism. How black co-ops can fight institutional racism. This is from August 9, 2016. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit of that with you here in just a minute. And this ties right into Kwanzaa, Seven Principles of Nguzu Saba. Okay, ties right into the fourth principle of Kwanzaa, to build and maintain our own stores, shops, and other businesses to profit from them together. Ujama, Cooperative Economics. And when we have co-ops, to have Cooperative economics, we have to cooperate. To have cooperative economics, we have to cooperate. And, and what happened was, at least one of the things that happened, was that African Americans went to white business schools or they went to uh, uh, business schools at HBCUs and were taught white business principles. Now, I'm not saying all HBCUs did this, but some of them did. So we went to these business schools and we learned white business principles. And then we, walk, we, we brought white business principles back to the African American community and tried to implement them. And they can work maybe on the individual basis, but they didn't work for the collective in general like the cooperative economics did. And as time goes on, that next generation comes, that next generation comes, and people forget about the co-ops, okay? Now, one of the um, one of the, one of the most popular co-ops that are still exist today are credit unions, okay? Because the members are owners of the credit union. That's a, another type of co-op. Sometimes people don't see it like that, but we don't relate the co-ops to African history and African American history, okay? So if we look at this article here from Vice.com, how's everybody doing? We've got Kim, we've got John Ray, we've got uh, Michelle. The African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Um, and email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com will let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Okay, we reach thousands of people across the country uh, each week with our various broadcasts. And uh, our current promotion we have going on for uh, a couple more days. Our current promotion, buy one month, get two months free. Buy one month, get two months free. We have special pricing for you right now, and uh, we can get you started today. But the question was asked, how do co-ops function in a cap capitalistic system? How do co-ops function in a capitalistic system? And um, she said, we have examples all over the world, and sometimes how that looks is is it it's it sometimes how that look is it's a small enterprise that allows smaller individuals to compete take a group like land land of lakes land of lakes which is one of the largest agricultural corporations it uh, it is actually a cooperative of dairy farmers that all own land of lakes together. Equally, uh, uh, it, they all own land of lakes together equally. And land of lakes buys its milk and produces uh, all the dairy products. So the co-op has the factories, does all the production, does all the marketing, handles the business side that frees the farmers up to do their dairy farming, uh, knowing that they have a market individually they would they would not be able to afford a production plant or afford all advertising but owning it all together the individual farms can now afford to compete okay now I've seen land delay so I don't eat butter okay unless I go to the movies and eat some popcorn okay but I don't I don't buy butter you know things like that I'm vegetarian I don't eat a lot of dairy products I eat ice cream some a little bit but um, I've seen land of land of lakes commercials for years I never knew that they were a co-op okay so she was asked what role has cooperative economics played in black communities in the US very good question 
African Americans have engaged in some form of collective economics throughout our entire history in America. Sometimes it was tilling kitchen garden, uh, tilling kitchen gardens on Sundays when we weren't working as enslaved people and sharing the produce. Sometimes it was putting in dues to bury loved ones. One of the things that uh, things like the Free African Society, 1787, and other co-ops like that, what we call benevolent societies, one of the things they're going to do is um, help people raise money to bury loved ones. Another thing that they, they would do during slavery, because we had co-ops during slavery as well, uh, free African Americans uh, form co-ops. Another thing that they would do is to raise money so people can buy family members out of slavery. Okay, so there's a, there's a deep history um, behind this, and most of us don't know uh, anything about it. Okay, so by the 1700s and 1800s, let me pull this article up here as well. By the 1700s and 1800s, we had more formalized systems of uh, collective economics that were more enterprise driven like insurance companies and collective farming. Okay, and the collective farming that would be like the colored farmers, uh, the colored farmers union. Eventually, we had collective grocery stores, and we, we, we're going to see um, the uh, Colored Merchants Association is, is going to be a co-op of African-American grocery stores who are, try, who are organizing in uh, 1928, 1929, because they have a big conference uh, for two months in 1929, and they're organizing to better structure themselves so they can better compete against the rise of the chain stores, the, the Kresge's and the Woolworths, the, the growing number of, of white-owned chain stores. And they're, they're uh, trying to, uh, they're pulling their resources together, they're buying in bulk so they can get uh, economies of scale, they can get better prices, uh, they, they are learning uh, marketing strategies, all different types of things like this. Okay. So but we, we have a deep, rich history of this. Okay, how you doing, Carl? Um, Kim, Cynthia. Okay, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. Okay, so by the 1700s and 1800s, we had uh, a more formalized, we had more formalized systems of collective economics that were more enterprise driven like insurance companies and collective farming. It did, eventually, we had collective grocery stores, credit unions, and health care. Europeans eventually recognized the model around 1844 and it formally came to the US. Blacks then started forming official co-ops in the 1860s and 1870s. By the 1880s, labor unions were actually helping workers to start their own co-ops and African Americans were involved in that too. So she was asked, did, uh, did the co-ops play a role in the civil rights movement? She said it was what I call a silent partner to the movement. This was done by African Americans partly to survive outside of US capitalism which was so exploitative it was also a way to create independence and wealth so we could be more politically active. Okay, so um, we have a deep, deep, rich history dealing with this. I mean, when you read uh, books like Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr., when you read any of these books studying, with, studying this history, we start seeing this, but it's not something that's really prevalent. Um, here in Detroit, we have the Black Food Security Network, which is a co-op. It's a co-op that you know I'm a member of. Um, I just renewed my membership um, September at the Harvest. You have uh, Malika Kenny and and uh, his group that have the Black Food Security Network. Um, the Root.com has a, a really good article about them, and you know I know I'm not a big fan of the Root, but you know they do have some good articles here and there. Um, 
but they have a good article I encourage you to uh, read. A nice Roberts, I like a lot of his uh, pieces he writes for the group. New generation of black-led co-ops want to end food insecurity. New generation of black-led co-ops want to end uh, food insecurity. And let me see, uh, they quoted uh, Maliki Kenny in here. And let me see, let me go to this. And also, uh, Roland Martin, uh, on Roland Martin Unfiltered, he just interviewed um, a pastor with um, a, um, a food security network, a black food security network that uh, a church has. But uh, the 1960s began a period of revived collective self-determination. White flight from urban areas to the suburbs uh, caused a phenomenon known as supermarket redlining, supermarket redlining. Major grocery uh, store chains decided to stop doing business in low-income neighborhoods and relocated to the suburbs. I remember seeing that happen. Ha happened here in Detroit. Okay, and I remember seeing different grocery store chains moving out of the city of Detroit as you have the white flight, uh, which started before the 1967 rebellion here in Detroit. And we saw it in other cities take place as well. And then after that, as you as you start having that deindustrialization of the inner city, which in the deindustrialization of the inner city, we're going to see take place um, after World War II. It's going to start before the 60s. It's really going to take place after World War II. You have the GI Bill of 1944 goes into effect in 1945. You have the uh, uh, Fair Housing Act of 1940 about 1949 or so the Fair Housing Act and the Fair Housing Act allowed white people to put 3% down on low interest loans to get houses built in the newly formed suburbs and then when African Americans try to take advantage of these loans we were we were uh, discriminated against they used that redlining system to discriminate against us when we tried to buy properties in the uh, inner city we were told these were high risk properties okay but you're using our taxpayer dollars to fund this program which is a government program so you have uh, when these men are coming back home for World War II this starts the baby boomer generation okay their families are growing they're trying to buy houses things like this so you have the, the suburbs that are being formed you have the US Interstate Highway Acts in 1952 and 56 that drive about 41,000 miles of US Interstate Highway all across the country it runs right through African American communities like I-375 ran through Black Bottom here in Detroit okay and we saw this take place all across the country and this displaced African Americans okay so here in Detroit a lot of, a lot of those African Americans that lived in Black Bottom they get displaced over to 12th and Claremont and 12th and Claremont is where the uh, 1967 Detroit Rebellion started okay because a lot of them were already upset because they got displaced some of those people moved up here during World War II, got jobs in the Department of Defense, uh, and they get jobs in the Department of Defense because of Executive Order 8802, which desegregated um, jobs in the Department of Defense. And that took place, that was signed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, but that was signed June 25, 1941, because A. Philip Randolph, who founded the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1925, A. Philip Randolph put pressure on Roosevelt to desegregate jobs in the Department of Defense, and he threatened to put 100,000 people, uh, 100,000 African Americans marching on Washington to embarrass Roosevelt. Okay, and Roosevelt was a Democrat. And this is at a period of time when we're transitioning from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party, which slowly transitioned and going back to 1928 and the Lily White movement in 1928 engineered by Herbert Hoover and the Republicans to get Ho Herbert Hoover elected as president. Okay, so you have to understand this chronology of history. And then this is going to lead up to so you have the deindustrialization of the inner city, all this taking place after World War II and these policies put in place and then uh, this is all during the Great Migration of 1915 and 1970, and more African Americans are moving up north, okay? And this is causing more racial uh, uh, tension, okay? Uh, more racial clashes are taking place. We saw 
1943 right here in Detroit. You had a huge, huge race ride up and down Woodward Avenue in Detroit during World War II. That's the Detroit race ride of 1943. Okay, so all this is going to lead to the deindustrialization de of the inner city where these uh, auto plants are being taken out of the inner city and put into uh, the suburbs and these factories are being put into the suburbs. So, so now that you have these suburbs being formed and white people moving to these suburbs, they need uh, grocery stores as well. So we see grocery store chains leaving the inner city, which are becoming more African-American and less white and moving out to the suburbs. Okay, so major grocery store chains decided to stop doing business in low-income neighborhoods and relocated to the suburbs. Black activists viewed the work of supplying quality food in their communities as part of the Black Liberation Movement, explained Malikia Kenny, who has been a food activist since the mid-1970s. He said, quote, there was always a school of thought in the black movement that promoted self-reliance through agriculture and food retail, end quote. Self-reliance through agriculture and food retail. Now, Malikia Kenny is currently a board member of the Detroit People's Food Co-op, which is a full-service grocery store slated to open in the year 2020 here in Detroit. It will be part of the Detroit Food Commons, a larger uh, community development complex, spearheaded by the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, where Malika Kenny serves as executive director. So we have these co-ops across the country, and they talk about some other ones here in this article. This is a good piece on Nigel Roberts, okay, for The Root, all right? But a lot of people don't, we're not connecting the dots with these co-ops, and we don't understand we have a deep, rich history in co-ops, and this is, these are principles we brought with us from, from Africa. Um, okay, so check out this article here from uh, theroot.com. Uh, new generation of black-led co-ops want to end food insecurity. And, you know, this is something that we have to, this is something that we have to, uh, this is a problem we have to solve, okay? Now, um, all black people I know eat food. All the black people I know eat food and like to eat, okay? So if we have black people who eat food and we still have African-American farmers, I think there's about 45,000 African-American farmers. If we got black people who eat food and black people who grow food, we should be able to get them together in a store with food grown by black people and black people who eat food can go shop and buy food. I mean, we should be able to figure this out. If black people eat food and black people grow food, we should be able to figure this out. But also, when I study history, I, find, I found out in history that it was African people who created agriculture. So we were the first ones who created growing food and planting food, but I also found out in studying history, and I've been studying for 27 years, I also found out it was African people who created eating food. So African people created growing food and we created eating food. Okay, so if we created growing food and eating food and we still do both, we should be able to figure this out. Okay, I'm just saying. All right, <laughs> All right so where did I get this shirt from? This is Atlanta. Um, this is a birthday gift. Uh, Herb Alchemist gave me this a couple years ago, a year ago, to uh, 2018. So you, uh, this was one of the vendors in Atlanta, and um, you see different vendors have this. Uh, Brother um, Khalil, Brother Khalil has this in Detroit. He has it in different colors also. So I got to get some more colors as well. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Carmelita said, wow, interesting, always follow the money, too many food deserts. Yes, yeah, but the food deserts are also an opportunity to turn this around as well. That's why this article from The Root is so important. That's why the segment that Roland Martin did on Roland Martin Unfiltered, I think it was uh, November 20th, December 23rd, I think it was the, I think it was the, the uh, December 23rd, 2019 show. So follow Roland Martin on YouTube at uh, Roland Martin and also on Facebook. 
at uh, Roland Martin as well. Okay, but see, all, all this ties into history. All right, now, um, if we look at, let's see, last thing, uh, let's talk about the Colored Merchants Association. Okay, and w w we see principles of um, cooperative economics with the SUSU system, which is a lending system practiced among many West Africans. So, AtlantaBlackStar.com has uh, a good article, Five Historic Examples of Cooperative Economics, Ujama, that advanced the black community. Five Historic Examples of Cooperative Economics, Ujama, that, adv that advanced the black community. All right, so the reason reason why all this is so important is because Kwanzaa is uh, coming up and for seven days of Kwanzaa you know we'll talk about uh, Ujima collective work and responsibility we'll talk about Kujichagalia self-determination and this is why I had to tell people when people say uh, you know we want a black agenda we want a black agenda and they're looking to elected officials especially white elected officials to give them a black agenda I'm like, you know, self-determination is not just something you talk about for seven days during Kwanzaa and you just go back to being, you know, uh, lacking self-determination the rest of the year. A black agenda is what we give the candidates and the elected officials. That's not what we wait on them to give us. People who have their history and culture intact and your history and culture gives you your values and interests and your principles. Your values, your interests, and your principles influence your economic empowerment and your political empowerment. People who have a sense of their history and respect themselves don't wait on other people to give them an agenda. They create an agenda and they push their agenda and present their agenda to other people. We have it backwards. But when we look at the Susu system, in parts of West Africa and the Caribbean, an ancient version of cooperative economics exists called SUSU, S-U-S-U. -S As one of the oldest forms of microfinance in Africa, the practice is run by one of Africa's oldest financial groups known as SUSU collectors. They, uh, now, SUSU collectors run their business from kiosk, kiosks in the marketplace and act as mobile bankers. And when we study any of these great African societies, whether well, it's ancient Kemet, Nubia, or Tanda Hesse, because uh, Nubia is a Greek word. Uh, Egypt is not the original name. We know that um, Kemet, meaning land of the blacks, is one of the original names. Also, you'll see Tameri, meaning the beloved land. When we look at uh, Great Zimbabwe, uh, we, uh, if we look at uh, Ghana, Songhai, Mali, any of these great African societies, we're going to see that they engaged in, they had some type of economy, they're going to engage in some type of trade, okay? Uh, whether it's gold, salt, uh, food, agriculture, something like that. They're usually going to have some type of African marketplace, okay? Where you can buy and trade goods, etc. All right? So they're engaging in commerce. We have a history of engaging in commerce, and we created the first economies. Okay, so when I hear people say well you know this community over here you know they have a history of uh, being in business things like this I'm like well, what do you think our history is sure slavery existed but we still have a history of business as well even during slavery and prior to slavery so they uh, the susu collectors run their businesses from kiosk kiosks in the marketplace and act as mobile bankers. Clients make low but regular deposits on a daily or weekly basis over the course of a month into a SUSU account. At the end of this period, the SUSU collector returns the accumulated savings to the client but keeps one day's savings as commission. SUSU collectors may also provide advances to their clients or rotate the accumulated deposits of a group between individual members. Today, SUSU collectors provide many West Africans who would otherwise be denied credit with access to money they need to start up small venture projects that in many cases benefit the community as a whole. Okay, 
So uh, now in the United States, black immigrants from the Caribbean have enjoyed one of the highest economic growth rates using a form of the SUSU and leveraging this practice to establish successful credit unions. So they, they're largely not relying on white banks to loan them green dollars that black people deposited in the white banks. You may have a few that do that, but no, they have, a, they have another system to get capital to start businesses. But, th but they're operating based upon, see once again, the African history and culture gives you your VIPs, your values, your interests, and your principles. And this influences your economic empowerment and how you engage in economics. This, this, this influences how you understand economics, the type of systems you use, whether it's cooperative economics, whether it's just white capitalism, okay? Or if you're, you're going to engage in some type of capitalism to a certain extent, because we live in a capitalist society, okay? But how do you engage in it? How do you engage in capitalism? Okay, and then this also influences your politics. All right, usually when I do my presentation, so, so two of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor James Small, when they teach, they teach about the, uh, the pyramid principle. So usually I show a picture of a pyramid, pyramids three sides, and these three principles uh, form each side of the pyramid. Okay, so when we look at Motown Records, I've lived, lived in Detroit all my life, right? And in 2020, I turned um, 49. I'll be 49, uh, June 7th. So we talk about Motown Records and how Motown Records, Barry Gordy, changed the world. And a lot of people know Barry Gordy got an $800 loan, okay, from his family to start Motown Records. But a lot of people don't know that $800 loan came from his family's co-op. His family had a co-op, okay? And it was called the, I think it was the Bear Gordy uh, Co-op or something like that. I forgot the exact uh, name of it. But he borrowed $800 from his family's co-op. Okay, a lot of people don't know this. When you go to uh, the Motown Museum's website, okay, I can't remember if it's, uh, what's, the, what's the website? I think it's MotownMuseum.com. Because I was doing some research uh, on them. But uh, when you go there, MotownMuseum.org, and you go there and they have um, a History of Motown, they have the tab, um, History of Motown. And they talk about this, and let me see if I can pull this up here. Uh, let's see if I can pull this up quickly. Okay, so a uh, hit, hit making songwriter. Um, they talk about Barry Gordy with an $800 loan in hand from the Gordy family's Bear Berry Co op. Barry set out in 1959 to apply some of the principles he learned in the auto plant to the production of records and the creation of music groups and solo artists. B E R hyphen. Barry co-op so he he borrowed the money from his family's co-op this th these are ancient African principles that we brought here and some of us are still implementing but a lot of us don't know how deep the history of co-ops are for African Americans this is why Kwanzaa is so important because Kwanzaa helps to tie us back into that culture and those traditions and, and that history because Kwanzaa celebrates family, community, and culture. Fam the FCC, family, community, and culture. Okay? Founded by, co-founded, co-founded by Dr. Mawu Lana Karinga. Not Malana Karinga. Malana is a girl's name. It's Mawu Lana Karinga. 1966. Okay? Because it was Dr. Mawu Lana Karinga and members of organization Us that founded Kwanzaa. It wasn't him by himself. Okay? Because I, I've communicated with some of the co-founders. Some of the members of organization us were co-founders. I've talked to other people who knew them. And I also talked to Dr. Leonard Jeffries and got a confirmation from him because he knows everybody. And I asked him. I asked him about this and he told me, you know, he was members of organization us who helped co-found Kwanzaa as well. So we have to give them honor and respect also. It doesn't take anything away from 
Dr. Karanga, you just have to give honor. I think it's important to give honor and respect to those other people who are co-founders as well. So the the seven principles of Kwanzaa, known as the Nguzu Saba, this helps to reinforce these principles. This helps to reinforce this history. You have Umoja, which means unity, to strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. Kuji Chagali is self-determination to strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. Uh, we know that, uh, I'm sorry, this um, uh, self-determination, uh, so we're dealing with um, understanding the powers, the ability to define and shape realities. Uh, Kuji Chagali deals with uh, uh, self-determination and uh, to define uh, reality for ourselves. Uh, to name ourselves, etc. Uh, Ujima, to build and maintain uh, our community together and make our brothers and sisters' problems our problems and to solve them together. Uh, Ujima, cooperative economics, to build and maintain our stores, shops, and businesses and to profit from them together. Nia, which is purpose, to make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their uh, traditional greatness. Kaumba, creativity, to uh, do always as much as we can and the way we can in order to leave our community uh, more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it. I'm looking at uh, this article that I wrote uh, a couple years ago dealing with Kwanzaa. Um, Imani faith to believe with all our heart in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, I say the leaders that deserve it because some of them don't. And the righteousness and victory of our struggle. Okay. Um, and then I, I deal with some of the principles, deal with some of the history here, make it relevant as well. This is an article I wrote. Let's see, I originally wrote it December 25th, 2015. And I updated it December 26, 2017. And you know, that's after Donald Trump stole the election and uh, won through the Electoral College because of uh, Russian intervention and voter suppression. Uh, but you can read all the articles that I write at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll post a link here on the thread of the broadcast, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And then um, also what we can do is um, I'll post a link here on the thread of the broadcast as well, okay? So we'll get you taken care of. Um, and then we know that um, Kwanzaa draws from traditional African first fruit harvest festivals as well, as well that we see taking place in ancient Kemet, in Nubia, uh, in Ghana. Uh, we see it amongst the Ashanti. We see them taking place amongst the Zulu in, in South Africa, etc. So Kwanzaa has a, a really deep, rich history uh, as well. There was a book that uh, Dr. Karenga wrote. Uh, that I read to get a better understanding of Kwanzaa. The African American holiday of Kwanzaa, a celebration of family, community, and culture. Um, and it, it really, uh, it's a really good book. It's, and uh, they give a lot of the cultural background, uh, pages 16 and 17. Uh, the African American holiday of Kwanzaa, a celebration of family, community, and culture. And one of the things he talks about is uh, in Kemet, the Festival was called Pert in Pert in Men, or the Coming Forth of Men in Mayan. Among the Zulu, it was called Umkosi, Umkosi. Among the Swazi, it was called Inkwala. Among the Matabele, uh, Inkswala. Among the Ashante, it had various names. Um, they also talk about amongst the, amongst the Yoruba of Nigeria. These are different first fruit harvest festivals that took place in Umkosi. Um, amongst the Zulu that took place around the same time of the year that Kwanzaa takes place actually uh, okay so you can check that out as well alright and then we also have the uh, lastly the Colored Merchants Association okay so uh, I've seen uh, some different articles dealing with the Colored Merchants Association blackden.com um, uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com, BlackPass.org, and the Color Merchants Association was uh, created right about 1928. 
and they were um, it comes out of the national uh, it comes out of the uh, the Negro Business League okay uh, which was created in 1900 by um, uh, Booker T Washington and this this co-op is going to uh, help African-American grocery store owners to uh, market their products better to uh, become more successful streamline their business become more productive more efficient and for two months in the spring of 1929 you had African-American grocery store owners in Winston-Salem who organized public public lectures meetings exhibits and and food tastings that attracted large uh, audiences and that and uh, national attention okay the grocery store owners were joining a new cooperative business called the colored merchants association the CMA okay which had began in uh, Alabama on April 17 1929 they announced in a local newspaper an ambitious plan to create a movement looking towards the salvation of the Negro independent grocery stores through cooperative buying and teaching the lesson and value of advertising. National Negro Business League uh, leaders uh, prompted the grocers efforts as a national model for African American businessmen working in an increasingly competitive marketplace because you, you have the, the rise of these uh, chain stores, okay, these, these white chain stores who are giving giving the African American owned grocery stores a lot of competition. All right now in the um, okay so in uh, nineteen twenty nine this the, you had a city directory for Winston Salem that listed three hundred and seventy three grocery stores. African American uh African Americans operated uh, more than 30 percent or 128 of these 373 grocery stores making up by far the largest group of black businessmen there in Winston, Winston, Winston Salem North Carolina these store owners faced new challenges because of important changes in retail trade and the uh, rise of the chain stores so the Color Merchants Association is going to help them to better compete against this and in collective courage but Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard she talks about um, the Colored Merchants Association as well what I have that I just saw it uh, page uh, 130 page 130 131 132 she talks about the um, color merchants association okay it's actually founded yeah founded in um, founded in Alabama 1927 the color merchants association the CMA was an uh, association of independent grocers organizing to buying and advertising cooperative uh, the creation of the CMA was to support independent African-American grocery stores with mutual support and collective marketing in a harsh market during difficult times. The early 1900s witnessed the consolidation of racial segregation in business and the height of white supremacist terrorism against black businesses. In addition to the advent and domination of chain stores, the local grocery stores were the most common African American small business along with insurance companies okay because uh, you, you need insurance you need insurance policy especially when you die but also everybody eats all black people I know eat so the grocery stores were the most common businesses that we that we had uh, the purpose of the CMA was to uh, was quote to pull money p-o-o-l pull money for buying products and advertising and to educate African-American merchants about modern business practices Goals included increasing stores profits by improving accounting methods, modernizing uh, store in interiors, modernizing store interiors to provide a better shopping experience and creating greater awareness of the buying power of African Americans. Okay, so check that out. Um, this is a powerful book right here, Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica, Jessica Gordon Nimhard. But we have 
this deep, rich history. We talk about some of this history depending upon the, uh, depending upon where you go for different um, Black History Month events. Some of them will, because some of them I know uh, um, a lot of people mean well, but a lot of times the Black History Month events, African American History Month events, is just you know recycling the same fifteen to twenty sanitized Negroes each year. Um, so people should go to asalh.org, asala, asalh.org, um, and that is the website that is the, um, th that is the organization that Dr. Carter G. Woodson co-founded, Association for the Study of African American Life and History, okay, it started out as Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in, uh, in 1915. And he created Negro History Week in 1926. So they are the official governing body of Black History Month, which is now African American History Month. There's a theme each year. They have, they give you guidance. They have resources there as well. So it's good for teachers and parents. Okay, Asala.org. So I talk about them a lot in uh, my presentations I do during African American History Month. Okay. All right. So once again, African American business owners, uh, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Also, be sure to check your spam folder because I talked to uh, some people. It goes to their spam folder and sits there two or three days. They don't realize it. Check your spam folder. If you email me, I'm going to email you back very quickly. All right. So be, uh, check your spam folder also. Uh, we can get you up and running today. Our current promotion uh, is going on for a couple more days. Buy one month, get two months free. Uh, buy one month, get two months free. Okay. All right. So, look, hey, we have to. Get, uh, also, hey, I'm speaking at the uh, Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, uh, second day of Kwanzaa, which is Kuji Chagalia. This Friday, December 27th. The event is 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. You're all invited. It's free and open to the public. Okay, and um, so I'm the keynote speaker there. I will be at the Charles H. Wright Museum all seven days of Kwanzaa. I'll be a vendor there all seven days, so come on down. Uh, visit theright.org, theright.org, uh, for more information in the Times. Uh, usually, let's see here, we're going to get the information on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, and then also, I'll give you the Times here quickly. Also, um, on Sunday, December 29th, I'm speaking at St. Francis Missionary Baptist Church, okay, for the Kwanzaa event. And uh, Deacon, uh, McCon uh, Deacon McConnell, Kenyatta McConnell reached out to me about that. And I speak at churches. A lot of people find it hard to believe. Churches are very, very receptive to me, okay. I, I speak at uh, churches, usually African-American churches. Uh, so that that's taking place 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Okay, uh, that is uh, fourth day of Kwanzaa Ujamaa Cooperative Economics. But the uh, Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, they they are celebrating Kwanzaa all seven days. Uh, the first day of Kwanzaa is December twenty sixth. Thursday, December twenty sixth, uh, is six p.m. to nine p.m. Okay, Umoja Unity. That is organized by the African Liberation Day Committee. Okay, second day of Kwanzaa. Um, December 27th, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., Kuji Chagalia. That's organized by Malcolm, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, Brother Bomani, Sister Shoshana, and their group. So I think this is my fifth year speaking for them, okay? I think this is my fifth year speaking for them. Um, so, I'll, so come on out. You don't want to miss my presentation. Saturday, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. is um, uh, Insaroma Institute, Okay. And that's 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Saturday, uh, December 28th. Sunday, December 29th, it's 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Ujama, okay, that's Aisha Shule School. I know there's people over there as well. Aisha Shule School, Insaroma uh, School. These were African centered schools that we had here in Detroit, okay. So I know those people. Malika Kenny was a founder of uh, uh, Insaroma, and uh, uh, Mama Imani Humphreys. Uh, who's an ancestor now? She was the founder of, uh, at least one of the. First she was the founder of uh, Aisha Shule. I think she was the sole founder, maybe the co-founder. So please excuse me, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Um, and then uh, Monday, Monday, December thirtieth, three p.m. to six p.m. Uh, NIA, which is Purpose, the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, 
uh, they're organizing that day. Uh, this the six day of Kwanzaa Kuumba, okay, um, which is um, creativity. That is uh, Nanu Giapo, okay, and that's a, a dance troupe, African uh, African dance troupe. Um, that's Tuesday, December thirty first. That's New Year's Eve, okay. So come celebrate New Year's Eve. Uh, celebrating Kwanzaa at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Uh, that day is 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, so you can still go out and party if you want to uh, <laughs> New Year's Eve night, right? That's 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And then Saturday, I mean, um, sorry, last day, sorry, days mixed up. Last day of Kwanzaa, January 1st, New Year's Day, Wednesday, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., it's Hood Research. So that's Theo Broton and her group hood research okay and uh, i've been on theo broton's tv show on whpr tv 33 in highland park michigan highland park is an enclave of detroit just just as uh, lesotho is an enclave of south africa lesotho is a country within south africa and the the uh basotho people of lesotho have these blankets that are traditional blankets and they have all different types of symbolism in them things like this and we saw these blankets uh, infused into the movie Black Panther so the warriors who protected the border of Wakanda wore these blankets that had that were um, they were infused with technology and they were infused with vibranium but those blankets come from the uh, come from the Basuthu people of the African nation of Lesotho it's spelled uh, L E let me see how's it spelled um, it's not spelled like it sounds it's uh, yeah it's spelled L L E S O T H O but it's pronounced Lesotho from my understanding um, but the but Lesotho is an enclave of South Africa, just as Highland Park is an enclave of Detroit, Michigan. Actually, Highland Park is where Henry Ford had uh, his Henry Ford Motor Company first in Highland Park, Michigan. So uh, Hood Research is organizing the Kwanzaa celebration on the last day of Kwanzaa, New Year's Day, uh, Wednesday, January 1st, 2020. 2020 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. so I'll be there all seven days and then uh, that Sunday I'm doing two days I'm, I'm in two locations and I think I'm doing my show the African History Network show that Sunday night on 9 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time so it's gonna be a busy busy day uh, so I think I'm gonna do my show um, that's the plan now but it's, that's gonna be the, the Kwanzaa is a busy busy seven days for me Okay, <laughs> it's a busy, busy seven days for me, but it's something I look forward to each year, and um, people really get to learn a lot uh, during Kwanzaa also. Now, also, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Also at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button. It helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, finance the research. Uh, do our, uh, helps us uh, do our Sunday night show, uh, pay the bills, etc. Okay. Um, all of my DVD lectures are at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. We have a um, current promotion going on for a couple more days. Um, spend $100. Get 40% off orders of $100 or more. And the uh, coupon code is there right on the home page of our website. Uh, I think the coupon code is AHN40 off 2019. Okay. And we have the uh, my new bundle pack, six DVD bundle pack, the Black Migration 1619 to 2019 um, bundle pack, which includes six of my latest presentations also. Okay, let me we'll post this link here as well. It includes Black Migration 1619 to 2019, Six Principles of Political Self Defense, Understanding How Laws and Policies Impact the Economic Conditions of African Americans, and uh, some other presentations I've done uh, for 2019 as well. Okay. All right, so look, guys, hey, we have, how you doing, Willie? Uh, what else we have here? Willie, Carmelita, Carl. 
All right, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Remember, right now, this corrects wrong behavior. is not over till we win. Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.